Okay, we are now recording. So welcome folks um, to our Valley Green Energy meeting. Um, we're here with Paul Gromer this morning to talk about uh, our responses to the request for information from the Department of Public Utilities. And with that, Paul, I will hand it over to you. Wonderful, thank you very much. It's good to see everyone. So what I wanted to do today was to explain the requests we've received from the Department of Public Utilities, put those in context a little bit, talk about our responses, and then drill into a little bit more detail about an issue that's relevant to one of the responses. So um, as is customary, the Bell Green Energy has received um, a set of questions from the Department of Public Utilities. They call them information requests. I can say that the these requests are very light. There are only three questions. Um, recently, municipal aggregations have been receiving 20, 30 questions. So it's a light set of questions. The essence of them is to update your plan to meet the DPU's most current requirements. So their requirements have been changing. They've or evolving, I should say. They've issued new orders since your plan was written. And they just, before approving it, they want you to catch up with the current state of things. That's very that's very common. Um, and it's, it, it's very common. I'll also say that getting these information requests is a positive sign in that it shows the DPU is looking at the plan, you're actively reviewing it. So that's, that's all very positive. Um, the other thing, just bigger picture, big picture, which will be a little relevant to the discussion is that the regulation of aggregation plans has been evolving and was going in one way and is about to go in a different way. So over the last several years, they've been increasingly um, restrictive of what programs could do and much more into the details of specifying you have to do this, you have to do this, you can't do that other thing. And that's still the current state, you know, those are still the current requirements and that attitude of things is, is in your questions because you have to apply with, comply with the current rules. I'll also say though, the DPU with the new commissioners in place, with the new administration, they're very actively looking at providing more flexibility to cities and towns in the operation of these programs. I have a very high degree of confidence that when they've worked through that process, though there will be more flexibility. And the DPU has said, anybody who has a plan that's already approved will be able to take advantage of the new flexibility. So. We're going to need to um, tighten some things up, just a few things to comply with the current rules, which are based on this direction. Soon, we can think there, there's going to be a shift and a broadening of authority, and we'll be able to take advantage of that once it's in place. It's just not there yet, but it will be in place with us. So that's the overview. The three areas that the Department of Public Utilities has asked for changes are, or the, I think they can be put into three areas. One is just to state in the plan some of their requirements. So in the past, they didn't require that you like say you were going to do X and Y because X and Y was required. So of course you were going to do it. But in the more recent regulation, it's just been a more of a a push on being explicit about some of the requirements in the plan. So the majority of the changes we'll make are just to do that, just to state rules you were going to comply with otherwise anyway, but you didn't, hadn't been before been necessary to write them down. Then, and this will be the most important, I think, discussion for today, there's a requirement for more detail about decision-making about the percentage and types of RECs that you purchase. So we've said in our in your plan, and this is typical, you don't want to make the decision now about how many additional RECs you're going to have, for example, because you haven't seen the price yet. So you can't make that decision in advance. And the DPU gets that and they're, they're supportive of that. It makes perfect sense. But their new requirement is, well, if we're going to give you that flexibility we want you just to be explicit, more explicit about who's going to make this decision and what criteria are you going to use? Mm -hmm. So 
I've proposed some edits to the plan, which we'll, we can look at in a minute, which we'll discuss that. So here's who's going to decide and here's who are, what are the decision-making criteria. The other area where they're more restrictive is in uses of the operational adder. We'd put in our plan, that's the extra fee that Valley Green Energy could collect through the energy price. We had put in there a whole bunch of things you could use it for. The DPU has, and we knew when we wrote it, it was asking for more flexibility than they had been giving recently. They knocked us back to what they'd been approving recently. I do think this is going to be is one of those areas that's going to loosen up or where more authority will be, more discretion will be given to municipalities. We'll be able to take advantage of that when it happens. But for the purpose of getting the plan approved now, we just need to scale it back. So those are the three areas. Um, so why don't I bring up the plan and we can look at those, the two things that matter, not the like you have to say this rule, that's just something you have to do and it doesn't matter. But the two things that do matter are the decision making around the recs, and then secondly, the operational ladder. We'll just look at those two things. And actually, forgive the long intro, but let's look at the operational ladder first. And that's because it's simpler, number one. And number two, on the decision making, we're going to go through what I've proposed for the plan. But then um, Stephanie suggested, well, in, to make this decision, it might be helpful to understand more about how this decision is actually going to make, be made to make the decision about how you're going to make this decision. Let's learn more about like what the decision is and how it will work. So we'll give, I'll give you like a preview of how that decision-making will happen once you're at the stage where you're taking bids. So that's a long intro. Well, I think it'll be maybe clearer when I start to show things. So the first thing I'm going to do is bring up the aggregation plan. I just have to find it here. All right, so and I'm just going to scroll to the adder section. Can you see the document with the scrolling going on now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is that big enough to see? Is it helpful if I make it bigger? It's okay with me, but it wouldn't hurt to make it bigger. Bigger right. would be helpful. All right, let me see if I can... Zoom that up. Is that better? Yep. Great. Perfect. Yep. Thank okay. you. All right. So this is the section of the plan regarding the operational adder. And this is a red line version. So it's what we proposed, what the DPUs asked us to add. The key thing is that we had proposed multiple purposes, personnel costs, rec purchases, enhanced customer education, and then other things, support for local projects that might help those projects help the program. The things the DPU has asked us to take out is everything other than personnel costs and rec purchases. So anything like to help local projects is out for now. Again, I fully expect that that authority is going to come back, but we just have to take it out for the time being. Then, in addition, they want to say, well, who's going to decide whether to collect the adder and how much? And so I proposed in here that it's the partners group that would decide. And I think it sort of has to be that since that's the memorandum of understanding under which you're operating as a group. Um, and then what's the criteria? I suggested what seemed like logical ones to me, which is the cost of electricity and the incremental value you could collect with this adder. Paul, are you asking for us to comment on this? Well, I suppose that, yes. Yeah, so exactly right. So you, <laughs> you you would need to be comfortable with this language. So does this, I'll, let me, I'll ask the question, does this make sense to you as an approach? Paul, well, I have one quick question, not directly to the language, but um, when do we anticipate those regulatory changes that would allow for more flexibility might happen? I mean, I know you can't say exactly, but roughly in your experience, I guess within the next six months. Oh, okay. 
All right. So this, I mean, by the time we get approved, this could actually change. We could have more flexibility soon after launch. Yes. Yes. Okay. Exactly right. That's what I'm thinking. Okay. That's and, and would and, and would the plan ahead, have Ron. to be amended again once in order to exercise that flexibility? Yeah. So that's that's a really good question, and the answer to that is not entirely clear. The DPU has said. They don't want to be looking at 150. There are 150 plans out there now. If they open up the rules, they don't want 150 plan amendments. So there's going to be some simplified process to take advantage of the new opportunities. I don't know what that is yet, though. That's one of the things okay. folks are wrestling with because it probably can't just be the towns can just go do it, but it also can't be they have to file a revised plan for approval because, you know, they, 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 the EPU couldn't handle the workload. So just um, wondering if, you know, the possibility of if we could have language or communities had language that said something like, um, you know, in adherence to current regulations um, and revised plans will be submitted upon regulatory change or something to that effect, but something that says that, um, that we could just submit a plan with the changes to reflect the change to regulations, but not that it needs approval. I'm putting that out there as a potential pathway, not for our group, but just wondering in general, knowing that you go back and weigh in. I'm just wondering if that's something that could be done. Yes, well, that's that's exactly what I suggested to them, that that's how they should do it, that the plan should, the town should decide how they want to play, change their plan. They should have a public hearing about it the way you had make the change and then just submit it so the DPU has it, but no approvals required. That that's exactly the process I suggested. They haven't decided yet what they're gonna what oh. they're gonna go with. But the, I think it's gonna be something along those it would have to be something along those lines, I think. Okay. Technical question. Go ahead, what go ahead, is, What does ESA? I'm sorry, what is what? ESA. Oh, that's the um, that's the that's the contract with the electricity supplier. So the okay. the adders electricity supply agreement in the rates, yeah. and so it's got to be reflected in that agreement. And it seemed logical. You, you and in, in practice, this is the way it works. Each time you enter into a supply agreement, you're picking a price, and you're deciding then, okay, do we want to include that adder, the adder in that price or not? That's the time to do it. Thank you. Um, Paul, do you have any uh, at your fingertips? How many kilowatt hours are the three communities going to use? In other words, how much money does uh, a tenth of a penny correspond to? Um, good question. I can't remember for certain, but I think it's in the ballpark of seventy-five thousand a year. But I'm mm -hmm. not. Certain. But I, it's mm -hmm. not ten, and it's not two hundred. So. Mm -hmm. That's 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 good. And the the other key thing, just while we're talking about the adder, is that, and this was true always, it has to be used for program related expenses. So you can't use it, you know, you couldn't use it for you wouldn't, but like fire trucks or something. It has to be for the program. And other changes, I'll just scroll through it because you'll see it in the plan. But these aren't these aren't things we can have any choice about, and they're just stating the law you know, you're going to set the way you're going to set the hours, you're going to figure out what your program expenses are, and then you're going to set the ad or commensurate with that. And what you do, you're not going to be duplicating what the consultant is doing. So you're going to be doing additional stuff. That's all. Obviously, it would have to be that way. We just mm -hmm. need to see that now. But this is just, this is just the rule. You're going to charge an amount that fits what you're going to do. What you're going to do has to be for the program, and you're not going to be double paying for things that we're already supposed to do for you. Sure. Um, it may make sense if this, because the structure around the rec decision is similar, it may make sense to flip to that and sort of talk, we could continue to talk through the same set of decision-making criteria when looking at, when looking at that, they're similar. And I want to be sure we have enough time for the rec discussion. 
Um, Carol has a question. Uh, yes, Carol. Hi, sorry, quick one though, related to the program fees that are uh, allowable now. There's now a bunch of other communities that are doing this. So there's examples of, because I, I know we struggled with this in the past, like how to do it that doesn't overlap with something existing. You're you're nodding. So I'll just take that as a yes. Thank yes, you. But, you know, that's just right. So most communities that have the ad are now use it for staff. And mm. it's just kind of like, like, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of like this, you, you, you have the staff do things that wouldn't be happening otherwise. Right. So you, you wouldn't have them do things that were happening otherwise. And so we, we work it out and usually it's a way to enhance the program, you know, provide mm -hmm. more service to customers because now there are more people working on it. So it's partly that, and it's also partly just covering the costs of the time that municipal staff is spending on this program anyway. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's covering that cost, which is otherwise covered out of other town uh, revenue. Yeah, so it's not coming from our capital or operating, it's coming from the adder. Correct. So so could we, so I'm thinking like Peregrine uh, M Mass Power is, you know, doing the high level stuff, getting everything up to run. And then like if there's, you know, local outreach, for example, um, that that kind of activity to make the community aware of the program and what it can do that that would be how we uh, spend that money yes or that's a good example and so and that's an area where there's some amount of that that we do but it has a limit you know be, you know we only make so much for sure money. we have other things we have to do i mean stop of surprises, course right so there's always more you could do and the the towns that take this out or they do more there and they're in the community every day so they can mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they can do more stuff, more events, more communication, you know, conversations with customers, more, sure. you know, more stuff, more, you know, more of the, just more of what you, what you want the program to do. And could these funds, like, do we have to look at these funds as going to a dedicated person who would be hired just for this, or could they be allocated to an existing position? Okay. Yep. Could be existing for sure. I think that and, was what you're just saying is that yeah. it wouldn't have to come out of you know, if so, for instance, Carol and I are both paid by our community right, and right now, right. We've spent, me especially, I've spent a lot of time working on this um, and that's being paid for by the town's funds. So Correct. in case now we could separate that out. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, like Tom's <clears throat> been doing this work for Pelham, would that enable Tom to get compensated for the time that he, like, he I am um, I it would go to somebody I, I don't need to be compensated but I appreciate the, the suggestion yeah. I'm I just mean, saying if someone were to you know for Pelham because Pelham doesn't have lar a large staff could Pelham use some of the admin fee to actually bring someone on even just to work on this piece part-time sure I mean however the numbers worked out you know or to it, it would work just um, mechanically might work better with an existing person. Well, mm -hmm. actually sort of thinking it through. I mean, maybe it's a handful of hours. Maybe you would, uh, you could hire someone on an hourly basis, a contract basis for this specific thing. It's a, you know, it's not a full-time job. It's a limited number of hours and you could pay for those hours for sure. And That's Bob, exactly that'll ultimately doing. be your call. Um, but I'm thinking, and thank you, Stephanie, for thinking of me, but I'm thinking like, you know, the people, um, um, in town hall that are, you know, you know, certainly that the burden has not been great at this point, but we've had Susanna posting them minutes and, you know, things like that, that, um, and if we were to do an event at the, um, uh, uh, library, for example, um, there would be staff time associated with that. So I'm thinking that once we get to the point of approval, the, the, we decide, um, as three communities, how, how that money might be allocated and then your, your call, Bob, on uh, how, how we would actually, you know, put people to work that I think there would be somebody um, already on staff, but I don't, I don't know that for sure. Well, thanks, Tom. It, it is something to think about. And I appreciate Stephanie bringing this up, bringing this up as well in terms of our community where it's a whole lot different and the incredible investment of time, your time, Tom, and also, um, you know, the folks from the Amherst and, 
and Northampton town halls. I mean, my God, you're doing a lot of heavy lifting right. here. Um, and it's very much appreciated. And so I'd, I'd want to make sure that whatever we do gets reflects, reflects that in terms of how we spend those funds. Excellent. Right on. Let, let me flip if it's okay. I'm just going to scroll back and we're going to look at that rec decision. Um, and sorry for the scrolling. Yeah, so this is the key one. So they ask you to do it. And what we have here is the description of Valley Green Energy Standard Green. So um, they ask us to say, they ask you, one is to, just a space here. They asked us to say a little more definition, like we, you said additional recs will, will like give us a range or something they've asked for. So this is the middle product, right? It's more than the, the bottom one and it's less than the top one. So mm -hmm. we said it's more than this, but less than that. And then this would be the key uh, paragraph is the bigger one in red there, which says the percentage and types of recs, you're going to be decided by the partners group after you get competitive bids um, and in considering factors, including cost, environmental impact, you know, where the generators come from and Massachusetts renewable energy requirements. Um, there's no magic to that list. If there's some other list that's more comfortable, these are just some, you know, some of the factors you might want to think about. Um, and then the other key things they want you to say, but this is stuff you would do anyway. Um, you can change it after you establish them. Um, if you do change, you just tell people. Um, and then you're going to say what the types of recs are in the program materials. That's You're going to do that anyway, you know, the opt-out letter, the website, and other things. So the second half of that paragraph is really just stating what the rules would be and what you would do. The first is about who's deciding and what the criteria are. And that you might want to spend a few, just be sure you're comfortable with that language or we can change it. There isn't magic to this. We just need to say something. Well, that, that language seems solid to me. Um, can't think of anything left out or that I would recommend adding. Yeah, I'm comfortable with this language because I think as long as we can include environmental impact, that was kind of our driver right from the gate. So I think as long as that's in there, that's important. Question about the location of the renewable generators. Um, is that specifically pertaining to the renewable generators of the RECs? Yes, exactly right. So what I was thinking there, and, and we discussed, right, you, 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 you recognize the premium value of generation in New England as compared to generation in some other place. So I thought you suggested that as one of the criteria to consider. Thanks. Yeah, I, I can't think of anything that I would suggest here. Well, it looks good to me. Carol, you want to weigh in too? I don't know if I should, but uh, <laughs> I, I would just, I, I don't know if it's helpful, but one of the things that I um, found useful is, as we know, class one wrecks are the most expensive. And um, I know there's a, a you know, a belief that that encourages further renewable development. And that's that's the driver behind aiming for that. Also just being local is great to New England. And um, I, I don't know if it, it's helpful, but there's also this EPA Green Power Partnership that has their criteria of what qualifies for green electricity. And those are newer than I think it's 10 years old. There's definitely some requirements and it's not the same as class one, but as a, I don't know if that could be a second tier of evaluation in addition to price that we could target EPA green power partner certified recs that, or it's not certified, it's it's a, a designation, but um, as a way to kind of, um, prioritize that we are having, because I, I'm not really sure how else you value the environmental impact 
So it's just another kind of stage. And I'll leave that there, not trying to open a bag of worms or anything, but just it's something that I, I use that that helped me to kind of have um, a framework to explain to the community of like why we did it the way we did it. Does, can that be in there, Paul? Well, yes. And what I would suggest as a way to capture this, the point that Carol raised, which I think is a is an important one, not just including the, the EPA standards, but just in general would be the age of the generator. So it's important, I think, to look not only at where I hadn't thought of this, but now the Carol's comments made me think you want to look just not only at where they are, but when they were built. So like class one has the requirement it has to have been built after a certain date. Um, EPA has a different, you know, more recent date, but you'd want to consider that as well. So we could put without referring to a specific, you know, standard, we could say the location and um, age operation date hmm. or age operation. Either, whatever. Operation date sounds more technical. Yeah. <laughs> I'd keep that in there. Um, because that's a really important factor, right? That's that's you know in, in just like location, that's a super important one. So the I think it's an enhancement to put that in there. Well, and the way the way this paragraph is worded, it talks um, in, and in consideration of factors including, which doesn't necessarily mean it's an exhaustive list. Um, it just means that you know these are the things that we'll look at, but there could be others. At least that's how I would interpret it. Maybe I'm wrong, but. That was just the intent, Bob, to to okay. some of the things you would look at, but leave you the flexibility to consider other things. Other yeah. things, right. So to Carol's point, that could just be the other things we consider, and we don't necessarily have to have that reflected in this paragraph. But it gives us the opportunity to be able to, to do that. Yes, that's what I was thinking, you know, because this language, it, it sort of gets to the class one rules, but doesn't say it has to be class one. It gets to the EPA rules, but doesn't say it has to be that exactly, but gets to the, the, the like sort of the factors or the criteria that are behind those rules. <laughs> um, so if you're coming, I mean, I'll say, um, you know, other communities have used language very much like this. They're thinking about it, you know, just the same way. Um, I'll ask, are you, if, are you guys comfortable with this language here? I am. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Carol? Uh, so if you guys are, are good, we'll go with this. I, I wanted to get to the, to looking at the pricing decision in more detail. Um, that will be an interesting conversation that, um, just maybe before we move that, just to the flag, the process from here. So we've discussed now what are the, I would say, are the substantive changes that the DP or the most important ones the DPU has asked for. There are also like a bunch of little things, as I said, that are more about stating what the rules are rather than changing anything in your plan. Um, as a process, we need to file the answers to the information requests and include with that a redline version of this a redline version of the of the other documents as well by next friday um is the group comfortable you know if if and i'm uh, sorry stephanie i don't mean to volunteer you but is it group comfortable if stephanie and i just work out the details of it from here or how would you like to proceed um from as a process matter I'm perfectly comfortable with that arrangement. Stephanie doesn't look comfortable. So. No, I'm I'm <laughs> fine. I'm just looking to other people to you know. I would you know like people to just weigh in. So Adele, Carol, Tom. I'm yeah. not sure if I'm following, but in in the past, because Peregrine's the best, they would make their edits based on our discussions, and then we just review it, and then. Right. collectively if there were any comments. So I guess I guess maybe that's what it is is yeah. you you would be the collector of the comments, Stephanie. Or yeah. okay. Or, I'm fine or with I that. think Paul is saying that I just uh, that it doesn't necessarily because of time. Right. I wouldn't necessarily go back to the whole group, but I think given right he would just make whatever edits and I would just review them on behalf of the group. Yeah. 
yep. following this conversation is all. It, and it's fair enough though. So it's, we have another week. I can um, go through, make sure I have everything done and send them to you on Monday with the red line. So red line version of this, red line version of the outreach plan. The letters got changed a little bit to explain what the changes are there. Why don't I just send everything to you, Stephanie, on Monday, yeah. and then you can circulate it to the others. Sure. It takes a chance to look at it. We do have until Friday. To, yeah. So, to and then it. I would want everyone's comments by Wednesday. If you have comments yeah. or concerns, yeah. or, I would want them by Wednesday. Excellent. And that's um, okay with you, Stephanie? That's not? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Totally yeah. good. That sounds like a good process. Yeah, um, thank you. So if you guys have a few more minutes, we can go through what the decision will look like when you're deciding about the amount of recs, like how that would work, just to give a little more color to what we've put here. So I'm just going to stop sharing this and share something different. All right. Can you guys see a PowerPoint there? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yep. So to back up a little bit on the pricing, on the decision process. So you decide about the percentage of additional recs and the types of recs, as we were saying, like when you get the bids from the electricity supplier. So you're making that decision when you know how much it costs. So you can say, okay, we're going to add X amount of recs because it costs Y. And we've decided Y is within the what we think is a good you know, reasonable price we want to charge for this. You want to make all those decisions together. The tricky aspect of it, and some of you have been through this before, I know, is that electricity price bids, when they come in, are only good for a couple of hours. And that's because the electricity markets are very volatile. So the suppliers won't hold the bid for a few hours. So the day the bid comes in, there's not a lot of time for, you know, thinking about, well, it's time to think, but there isn't a lot of time for, a lot of time for conversation or process. You have to be ready to decide on that day. So you need to do the process ahead of time to be ready. The way we try to help facilitate it, that is before we get the, the actual bids you need to decide on, a few weeks before that, we get what are called indicative bids, which are non-binding, but they'll just give you a sense of what you're going to see. Those bids you can take your time with. You're not making a decision on them, but you can look and you can see, okay, well, this costs this, that's going to cost that. And you can kind of narrow down your decision criteria. So you're ready to make a final decision quickly on the bid day. So we give you those indicative bids first and we go through them with you in a in the same format. You're going to see the actual bids on bid day. So you're not only familiar with the numbers, you're familiar with the formatting, try to make everything as clear as possible. So what I did today to walk you through that was to do a, like an illustrative version of the indicative bid. So this is completely phony, but it's the same form of presentation, the same decision. So that's, that's what I'm going to walk through now, if that makes sense for folks. So, um, so what would happen is we would, we would get the bids in, we'd schedule a meeting for you and we go through a PowerPoint that looks like this. The first thing, just a little thing, but you want to keep these bids confidential because you don't want the different suppliers to learn what each other is bidding. So it's in it's in your interest not to, to keep this as a private conversation, and that's allowed by state law. It's specifically exempt from uh, public disclosure. So these are the things we would, we, you know, the goal, this is the indicative presentation. So the goal is to get ready for the actual bid day to learn if you need more information so we can gather that for you in advance. And we look at a few different things, market prices, a few other things. So I'll just, I'll tick through them and I'll go through it a little faster maybe than we would on the real thing. So the first thing we often look at is what's going on with electricity in the electricity market. So this, this graph is probably looks a little more confusing than it is. So what it shows is the cost to buy electricity at any point in time for delivery in the future. And that's because that's the decision you're making. You're deciding today for electricity to be delivered to you, supplied to you next year and the year after that. And the way the markets work, they're forward prices. So I know I can make a, make a commitment to buy electricity today for delivery in a year at a specific price. And the different colors here show the different years of delivery, but more important than the colors is just the shape. And what we see is that 
electricity prices. This is in New England, and these are just wholesale costs, they're not the full cost. It was really stable for about eight years. And then once we got into COVID, prices started going up with the war in Ukraine, prices really skyrocketed. They've come back down now and kind of stabilized a couple pennies higher than they used to be, but much better than they were at the peak. What's relevant for you about this graph is two things. One is, does it seem like a good time to be buying electricity or does it seem like a crazy time in the market? You know, up at that peak was a crazy time, but we're not at that now. And then second, looking at this, do we want to make a long-term price commitment or a short-term price commitment? Back when prices were really stable all the time, a long-term commitment seemed like a good deal and turned out to be a great deal for the communities that did it. When prices were way up at their peak, it wasn't a good time to make a long-term commitment because they could come falling back down at any time. And so at that point in time, when right at the peak, most communities went with a shorter term price and that worked out well for them too. So they had that high price for a year or so, but then were able to get a better contract after the prices dropped. So this is just information that helps inform the kind of decision you're gonna make. Um, the next thing we'll do, you guys don't need this so much, but just a reminder of what are the options in the program and what decisions are you making? And you're, this is really focused on the standard product. It's gonna have some additional renewable electricity, the percentages to be decided. And that's one of the things you're deciding as part of this. Um, and then these are the decisions you're gonna make whether to accept a bid, because you can always say, no, we don't like any of these. We want to try again another day. But if you select a bid, you're going to decide on a term, you're going to pick a supplier, and then you're going to choose the percentage of voluntary renewables. So that was all the wind up. So once you see the prices, they're going to come in and it's going to look like this. You're going to see a table and it's going to have different suppliers, a column for different suppliers. And when the bids are real, you'll see the names of the suppliers. This is just generic for today. And then different terms. So a 12 month term, 24 month term, 36 month term. And then you'll see you get different prices from the different suppliers for the different terms. And what we'll do on the day of it is one will talk through the different suppliers who are the best to work with, who are, and if any of them is an outlier, you might feel, uh, you know, you might have second thoughts about picking or whether they're all, you know, good solid companies. And by and large, we'd only bring in bids from good solid companies, but we'll, we'll talk through that. And then we'll talk through the different terms and you'll decide based in part on, you know, how long a commitment makes sense given where the market is and also how the prices differ by term. So sometimes some terms are way, the price is noticeably lower than the others. I don't think that's so much the case in these this example, but if 24 months was a lot lower than 12 or 36, you might head towards 24 because that seemed to be the most attractive price. Um, and then we'll also have, you know, the key comparison is how do these prices compare to basic service? And so, we'll have the basic service prices down here. So you can make that, you can make that comparison and we'll have the price for the current basic service term. And then we'll give you an estimate of what it's gonna be for the next basic service term. Basic service terms are only set six months, prices are only set six months at a time. So we can't say for certain what the next one's gonna be, but we'll give you our best estimate and maybe give you a range on what that's gonna look like. You know, at program launch, the most important comparison is to the current basic service price. But you'll also would want to be know as much as you can about you know how those prices are trending and what the next one is likely to be. Um, and then, and we can go back to this if it's important. But I want to like complete the picture. You choose this price. This is the price for base electricity. It's all the required renewables, everything that's required, but nothing else. And then you're going to decide the additional renewables on top of that. And so the way that works is we create this other slide, which begins by taking one of the prices from the slide before for the base electricity. 
And then we show the cost of additional recs at different percentages. So just for illustration here, I used 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%. We can use whatever percentages you want. And then to see what the total price would be, you sum those, those two numbers. So you know, in this 20% column, for example, you've got 14.6 cents base price to get 20% extra recs costs eight tenths of a cent per kilowatt hour. And so the total would be 15.4. And then you could compare that to the basic service prices down in the bottom left and decide, you know, does that seem like a good price or do you want it, you know, is there room for more extra renewables or you want to keep the price a little bit lower, so you'd maybe you go to a lower percentage. That was a lot of talking from me. So um, I'll pause there and ask if there are questions or things we should drill on, in on either on this slide or the slide before. Paul, well, this um, the point where we go over um, well, this is the indicative pricing. So this is kind of the initial conversation that we have. Correct. But then when it comes time for, and you're going to get to that in a minute, I think. Well, it's going to look just like this, except that they're going to be actual bids and you're going to have to decide. So the, the presentation looks the same either way. Yep. First, you'd see it in an indicative where there's plenty of time to talk about it. And then you'd see it on an executable price day where you'd have to decide within an hour or two. So I think the key here, which I wanted to point out because it came up in our conversation, is when it's time to actually make that decision, who is making that actual decision? Because I think you refer to mayors, executives are typically the ones that make that decision, correct? For, correct. For, um, for an individual community, yes, exactly right. So um we did this with the city of Beverly last week or maybe earlier this week, it was the mayor. So the people in the room were the mayor, his sustainability staff and other key staff who he views as his, you know, important advisors. He decided it because he signs both because he's the chief executive of the city and he signs the contract with the supplier. So he's making this pick okay. for you. I'm very glad you raised this, Stephanie, because this, this is actually the reason to bring this up today who's going to make this decision for Valley Green? It's going to be, I think, well, I'll suggest, but you guys decide it would have to be the partners group. So one representative from each municipality. And then I think you would decide who would be the person from the municipalities. You know, would it be the chief executives from the municipality? So the mayor and the town manager and, and you, Bob, or you could delegate it to somebody else that would be that would be up to you well i think that's i mean i think it's up to our executive like in my case it's not up to me or this group it's up to the town manager who he wants to delegate to make that decision because it may be him but it like i know our former finance director was more than capable um and actually the finance director before him as well so i think you know, he may do it himself or he may want them to do it. So again, it's who he designates, but I think he would certainly want the representative of this group to be present, which would be me, at least for now anyway. And I I don't know how North, I would assume Northampton would be maybe similar. I don't, I don't know. And Bob, I guess you all, you, Tom, would decide who for Pelham. Yes. Yeah, and Bob, you know, um, uh, I'm a, I'm an advisor to the Energy Committee, but um, John Larson, I think, is still the chair, right? And uh, yes, yes. John's John's with the Rhodium Group, Paul, and uh, I think has a wealth of knowledge about um, electricity markets. So, I mean, to the extent that we can, you know, get the process information earlier, I'd love to get that in front of him and uh, the rest of the Energy Committee for their input. Well, uh, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say to the point that when we were talking about when we received this indicative pricing, um, we talked about, uh, Paul and I talked about how we could do this in a way that, you know, it could basically be shared publicly, at least this initial mm -hmm. conversation. Um, the final decision making is obviously not going to be public, but 
at least uh, Paul said there's a way in which you can sort of do a range or some way that it's not specific um, that would allow us to do this in this meeting. So with this group, we could just make sure that we have those folks, you know, like John um, at this meeting. Mm -hmm. What do we do if the uh, decision maker is not available on the day that it has to be done? So, um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. So we would, they have to be. So we schedule it in a day. <laughs> yeah. And they have to, is that they, you have to be able to decide in your, however you want to decide since you're a group, you, you know, you, you, by whatever process you get to pick the process, but you have to be able to decide. And some, some person has to sign a contract that day. If you're not able to, then the bids would no longer be valid. So I guess let's see if the worst happened, you know, the, whatever reason the person is supposed to decide can't be there, be part of it. We would just have to, cancel it or we would see the bids but we couldn't commit to any of them and we'd have to do it again another day i think in our process so paul you said one one community because we're an entity one community and amherst currently being the lead would sign but the decision would be made by the three communities amherst isn't going to go in and just make the decision for everybody you know we're going to have the meeting and have the discussion with leadership and that decision will be made and then amherst just signs the contract but it's not amherst's decision i just want to be very, very clear about that. Carol? I, I, I've i been through this process many times and I I guess I would want to have a um, an identified process because it does happen so fast on the day of, I think we have to have, if, if we're allowing one person to be the decision maker, that person has to know what the other community's priorities are. And I think um, that's a little tougher done than said maybe, but but I, I think we would need to kind of hash that out. And um, the other thing I would just say, and Paul, I don't know if other communities do this too, but what I found really helpful is I would bring the mayor in for the indicative pricing, which typically happens the week prior, so that, and then we'd have like a, you know, a call to go over everything. I, you know, our roles, you know, Tom, Stephanie, and me are to kind of like bring the information to kind of make a recommendation based on all of our discussions and expertise. And, and then, but, but ideally, you know, the mayor is the one or the chief executive is signing this long-term, very high stakes contract that they, I, I, you know, I just think it's really important that they are completely comfortable with it. And that, that's been an issue. You know, we just want to make sure that they are. And again, like once you get into this green, that green, I think they're kind of like, go, go, go. But um, I think having that conversation with them, with the indicative pricing going into the actual bid day and again, making sure that they're there. I, you know, I'm like, I need you by two 30 for like five minutes. And I need you at like 1130 to give me the green light. And, um, and again, it, you know, it's, it's a fun day, but uh, I feel like we are given enough information so that it's, it's, it's not usually a surprise. It's like when we get the pricing, we already know what we're looking at kind of. So I, I think as much as we can front load and have those decisions, I'm just nervous because one of my top goals obviously is we've always supplied 100% green electricity, different shades of green. We all know that. Um, uh, and and it's been a process that gets refined as, as we learn more and as things change. But um, it, it, it's being really mindful of the price to the community. And so that's the only thing I'm really nervous about. I, I want to make sure that we all agree that we're, you know, we, we have a point where we're not going to sacrifice price for greenness, because I think there's a lot of people that will not, you know, they'll suffer. So I think, Will, I think, Carol, that's the point of having the, you know, with the indicative pricing meeting, um, in my mind, that does include the mayor and the executives. I think okay. it has to. That's, it wasn't just for this group. It's for us with our executives. 
so that we have that indicative pricing meeting. And then when it comes down to the actual day of have to make the decision, it's likely going to just be the executives and staff um, because we have such a small window. Um, yeah. That And the decision, you know, the decision, although it has to be fast, is going to have to be made by all of the executives from the three communities and then Amherst just signs. But that's what I was trying to say before. Amherst will sign, but it's not in a vacuum. It's going to be, they have to make it. That's why the indicative pricing meeting is going to be so important because that'll be a place where a lot of what you're concerned about can get hashed out before we get to that actual decision. Does that sound reasonable? Yes. Okay. And, and ultimately, um, I mean, that information on the lower left, if, if people want to opt out for price reasons, then that's that's their choice, right? I mean, we've known that we're probably not going to have a cheaper option per se um, uh, by virtue of, like, like that can't even be part of our objective for this, right? That was what all the testimony prep was about. So uh, I, I get what you're saying, Carol. It's a, it's a delicate balance. Well, I can make a couple of predictions and uh, I'm willing to wager on this that uh, first of all, you will find out that the community very quickly will learn what a mill is and they will know that, you know, they, they're they going to know the prices of electricity and they're going to be on it. It's pretty remarkable how kind of educated they become. But also, you know, we were like 10 years in and still getting calls that uh, they never got their opt out notice or, you know, never got their mailing. And so, you know, you can th there's just certain things that uh, continue on. But I, I will say overall, we've experienced it as a very positive thing that makes the community very proud. And I, I think this, you know, I, I really believe that this is a great um tool to use for our communities. I'm I'm just again been through this. <laughs> so just want to make sure everything works out. And it's great. Thank you. And, and, and actually there are two var well there are more than two, but <clears throat> one of the variables of course is price in each of the different um <clears throat> offerings. But the other is duration. Um and so when we're comparing or when we're educating our our public to compare the what what's on offer here, um, the understanding that the basic price changes every six months, and you don't know where that's going, um, and our price is established for X, whatever the term is that we decide. So there's the there's the price and there's the duration um, that I think we need to emphasize, <clears throat> in addition to the green content of the three options. Right on. I have a hard stop here in about a minute. So, Bob, I will take it upon myself to get you and the uh, Energy Committee uh, a memo, um, brief as it may be, just so that we're, you know, all on the same page here. And, Paul, I don't know if this slide deck is something that you can or plan to share, but that might be a good attachment as well. This meeting is being recorded, so I can, uh, it's posted on the Amherst YouTube site, but I can send it to the committee I will because I know that Andra and Adele were not here today. Oh, I'm sorry, Andra and Darcy were not here today. So I will send this link out for this meeting so that they can see the recording. And then you'll have that, Tom, you can share with them. Thank you very much. I figured as much, Stephanie. <laughs> All right. Have a great Friday, everyone. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Bye. Does anyone have any final questions? I'm going to put the minutes off. We'll just do it next time. So, Paul, do you I think I'll go ahead. I just, I just want to say thank you. This is this is like an amazing group of people to be working with here, and um, I'm sort of humbled by the by the opportunity of our little town to be involved with uh, with Northampton and Amherst and with your group, Paul, uh, to make this happen. So, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Great. Thank you, Bob. Um, Adele, any anything you want to check in about before you go? You're all set. Okay. All right, um, Paul, thank you so much as always. So I'll get that into the materials from you. I will share them with the group on Monday when I receive them. And then by Wednesday, I'll need any feedback. 
I will get any feedback to you, Paul, uh, by Thursday um, so that you can have your responses by Friday. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, everybody, thank you so much and have a great weekend. Bye-bye. All right, okay. bye.